start, as we have each of these messages, with a reading of the Beatitudes. The first four uh, speak to a circumstance that you may not necessarily want to be in, but you found yourself in. Maybe all of us have at different times. The last four um, speak more to who you are and how you act and what you choose to do and who you choose to be. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Friday, I read a uh, compelling story in the Globe and Mail about the compassion and mercy of a priest who lives in the warring nation of Central African Republic. And I uh, cut the story down from the Globe and Mail article written by Jeffrey York, and uh, this is what I read. Six weeks ago, Muslim shepherd Umaro Mandi was saved by the kindness of a Catholic priest who led him into a church to escape the savage attacks of a thuggish Christian militia. In the chaos of the Central African Republic, peace remains an illusion. But amidst the sectarian killings, the mob lynchings, and the mutilations, there are some heroes. One of them is Catholic priest Xavier Arnaud Fagba, who opened his church doors to protect nearly 700 Muslims from near certain death. About six weeks ago this happened. They didn't have anyone to help them said Father Fogba, 31, who became a priest just four months ago. When the Muslims were attacked, the people didn't help them. That's when I decided to look for them and bring them here. I did it in the name of my faith. My faith asks me to transcend the most difficult obstacles. Father Fogba rescued hundreds of Muslims that day, going house to house and even into the bush to find them. A mercy that searches and moves. A few days later, when Father Fogbo was visiting a sick parishioner, his car was surrounded by angry militia fighters armed with machetes and knives, and they wanted to kill him for sheltering Muslims. The priest got out of his car to show that he was unafraid. I wanted to show them that I didn't regret, didn't regret what I did, he said. And luckily... A militia commander saw the confrontation and shouted to his men to spare the priest. But on the night of February 4th, after some militiamen were killed by Chadian peacekeepers who were escorting Muslims to safety outside of the country, the militia attacked the church to take revenge. The Muslims were crying, terrified, as machine gun bullets hit the church from all sides. The priest recalled that he told them to lie on the floor, and he hit the floor too. And nobody, miraculously, was injured. But dozens of bullet holes can still be seen in the church today. No one knows how much longer the Muslims will have to stay at the church. But on Sunday mornings, they get up early to clean the church and sweep the floors so that it will be tidy when the Catholics arrive for their service. Father Fogba preaches peace in his sermons. And he leads his parishioners outside of the church to exchange handshakes with the Muslims. Facing a country whose recently proclaimed peace is so tenuous and fragile, he says, I'm very sad about it. I thought it was the beginning of peace, but it was too early. But not too early for him. What really struck me when I read that on Friday was the, the sentence, They didn't have anyone to help them, said Father Fogba, 31, who became a priest just four months ago. And I thought, welcome to the priesthood. <laughs> and he was just a rookie. 
And he probably didn't know any better than to actually do what Jesus would have done in that situation. It was as though it was, there's no other option but to risk his own life in mercy for the sake of another image-bearing human being, 700 of their lives. Run into their homes to bring mercy and even into the bush to find them. In his fifth beatitude, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And the mercy extended to Father Fogba in this particular case was his life. Jesus was merciful all of the time, most of the time, all of the time. When he came across an outsider, a leper, a sinner, somebody who was lost, he had compassion on them, the Bible writes. It welled up from deep inside of who he was, this heart for that person, that person on the outside, that broken person. As he stood with a woman who'd been caught in adultery and all of the self-righteous were ready to stone her to death, which was the law of that day, he said, neither do I condemn you. As he hung on a cross, taking it for so many others, and a criminal beside him says, remember me, ask for forgiveness de facto, he said, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was merciful, and he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they, merciful people, will be shown mercy. Hmm. It's almost as though your actions are going to have something to do with the mercy that gets extended to you by God. Jesus is parable of the unforgiving servant hits it home even harder. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. So imagine we're all servants. As he got underway, one servant was brought in before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. He couldn't pay up, so the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods, to be auctioned off at the slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. And touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him ten dollars, and he seized him by the throat and demanded, Pay up now. And the poor wretch threw himself down and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back but he wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put in jail until the debt was paid, and when the other servants saw what was going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. And the king summoned the man, a trembling, and said, You evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. And that's exactly, Jesus says, what my Father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. It's a little bit troublesome for my Calvinist theology that says that once you're in, you're in, and there's nothing you can do to be shaken free from the love of God, and he'll never let you go or leave you or forsake you, and I believe that with all of my heart, and I believe what I just read with all of my heart, the other half of my heart, (laughs) the Arminian side of my heart, the free will part of my heart versus the sovereign part of my heart. That is exactly what my Father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone, anyone who asks for mercy. So the message in that parable of Jesus is don't be a jerk towards other people thinking your good theology is going to save you because God might just change his mind. 
Or maybe there's another way around it. Perhaps people who aren't merciful to other people never knew God's mercy in the first place. The theologian Frederick Dale Bruner wrote, the test of one's relation with God is one's relation with other people. You can say you believe one thing, but if you don't show, give some evidence of what you believe, then really, what do you, I, know? I mean, how can you ever be an unmerciful jerk like that guy who was owed 10 bucks when you've been forgiven everything? It, it, it doesn't make sense. That should be a non sequitur. And yet, we segue freely from grace to judgment like that. Not so much me, but you guys. I know some of you. You're judgmental. <laughs> Dale Bruner writes, There's a morality that hardens. It makes one more severe with others the more one has learned to be severe with oneself. This is a tempting root in our faith of sacrifice-centered, spiritual disciplines-focused, perfectionist, higher life, and consciousness-raising ethics. But the first test of obedience to Jesus' ethic is not whether obedience makes one morally tougher, but whether it also makes one mercifully softer. Mark Twain once wrote of a self-righteous jerk, he was a good man in the worst sense of the word. Now, was it you that he was talking about? A good woman in the worst sense of the word. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Condemnation comes so easy for me. I judge others to hide my brokenness. If I knock them down a few notches, then I'll de facto be raised up a few notches. If I focus all the time on other people and how foolish they are, I'll somehow be hidden from looking at myself and my own judgment and foolishness. Now, I never tell myself that when I'm doing the judging, of course. <laughs> and you don't either, obviously, or you wouldn't do it. Sometimes my lack, very often my lack of mercy manifests itself as a lack of patience. I uh, have a fuse that's about that long sometimes uh, when things go wrong and are offside or hurt me. Eugene Peterson taught me that uh, this week as I listened to one of his talks that uh, sometimes people have a genuine zeal for the right thing and a good thing and for a not right world to be made right. And they really do want it to be made right for all the right reasons, God's reasons, but he says, while I'm passionate for God's cause, I'm impatient with God's methods. That's the difference between a Pharisee and a self-righteous hypocrite and Jesus. The, the attribute of mercy, if you think of God being perfect and holy and us being who we are, characters, the attribute of mercy is, is perfect, it must be perfect and constantly manifest in the being of God in relation to creation. Because of his love, God must be perpetually patient with you all the time. And if you're made in God's image, and I'm made in God's image, then I guess I am called to be perpetually patient in extending mercy and grace to others. As much time in my life should be spent expending mercy, much more time in my life should be spent expending mercy than I spend judging other people. It should just be totally merciful. 
very little judgment. That should define us, you, me. Peterson also made an interesting observation that if you're busy judging all the time, you don't have any room, and your being will be transformed into something else that has no room for mercy. You'll be incapable of receiving mercy, he said. Our condemnation hardens us to God's mercy, which maybe is why Jesus went so hard at those self-righteous religious folks who judged others so hard. Their constant judging had calcified their spirits and made their hearts into stone relative to other human beings. But God also has a softer side. Through the prophet Ezekiel, he said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will do that because you're so prone to go in the other way and incapable of doing it yourself. I will do that. I will remove your stubbornly judging heart and give you a real heart and a new spirit, my spirit. And I'll do that because I love you so much and I can't but be merciful to you. When God looks at you and sees our, your, our condition, it just wells up in him. They, they don't have anyone to help them. What else would a loving God do? And, and what else should a loving Christian do? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. How else will the world know that God is real if we're not merciful people? Eugene Peterson again rightly noted that rarely are people condemned into a better life. Most often they are forgiven into that better life. You and I included, right? You judge somebody and you just... You're, you're doing the anti-Christian thing, and you're pushing people away from the love of God. But you show them a, a mercy that is so unworldly and so surprising to them and so beautiful and good. Through you, they may see the face of God. Forgiveness through mercy restores relationship and intimacy. And God is all about bringing things back together. When you set someone free by forgiving them, which doesn't mean they don't have to live with the consequences of what they did, which doesn't mean everything's fine again, but you're, you're choosing to put down the anger and the desire for revenge against that person or those people. When you do that forgiving via forgiveness, you're obeying. You're one of these blessed, merciful when you save somebody by just helping them, giving them your coat or supporting a group that supports them, when you look past somebody's brokenness or their gruffness or their toxic personality or their anger or their phobias or their pride or their aggressiveness or their controlling nature or their obtuseness and see the real person underneath, you're obeying Jesus' call to be merciful. Mercy sees with the eyes of God. And when you're doing it, and it's welling up in you, I'm convinced you're with God. And God is with you. And you can experience the merciful heart of God even as you extend it. And to act in mercy, and maybe over the last 20 minutes, and a, a circumstance has come up when you haven't, and you're now thinking, maybe I could or should, or maybe that's going to happen this week or this month. And you're going to be faced with a choice. And you can bail on it and do what comes natural. 
or you can step into this new way and let the Spirit of God residing in you well up and extend something with love and mercy to that other person that brings glory to God in heaven and a little bit more heaven on earth. So that moment is your moment now and this opportunity to be the face of God to that person or that group is yours. Let's pray. But I don't want to do that, God. (laughs) Those people uh, hurt me or they got in my way. I'd rather be impatient and judging or angry or apathetic or feel nothing towards others, the most dangerous, maybe. I pray, God, for me and for us and for this community that we wouldn't be able to do that anymore, take the easy way out, the shortcut of impatience or judgment that we'd be able to engage in a new way the hard work of loving others as we love ourselves and extending mercy as a result. And that this community and people here in their communities, at work, at home, at school, that they'd be seen, we'd be seen differently and be known as people who, who love deeply and who create community and build the world, heaven on earth, uh, the way you call us to pray for it to be. So help us, God, to uh, be those people, to be your people in that way. Jesus, we pray this in your name as you called us to be merciful. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, who weaves a heart of mercy into all of us, a new heart. And in the name of God, our Heavenly Father, who made us to be merciful people, it's what it means to be human. In his name we pray, amen.